So let me start by sort of highlighting what is the um, really conventional but also the most accepted paradigm for discovering in, in, in biology and in medicine. Uh, in terms of sort of trying to figure out what are the genetic variants and maybe either germline or uh, somatic mutation in the case of, uh, of cancer um, that are associated with a specific phenotypic outcome. And really the vast majority of research that is going on today, and I would say the entire paradigm of precision medicine today, is actually predicated on that arrow that goes from the mutation to the actual phenotypic outcome. For instance, um, you may want to know that if you have a particular mutation, you are more likely than not to uh, develop a particular uh, pathological condition. Um, and so when I, when I talk about putting the word, putting precision in precision medicine, I'm actually going to talk about how we can actually take away that arrow and turn it into a very specific mechanism, because that arrow right now is typically a statistical association. and doesn't explain how or under what circumstances you actually really induce the phenotype. And so this has been actually quite uh, uh, kind of fundamental in, in elucidating some of the uh, major a determinant of disease etiology, in fact, of trait etiology. Um, for instance, in the case of ALS, uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, uh, we know that familial mutation, rare uh, familial mutation in the SOD1 uh, superoxide dismutase gene, uh, have been associated with 100% penetrance in the disease. What is the problem with that? The problem is that as of today, maybe 30 years after the discovery, we still have absolutely no clue of how that particular mutation induces ALS. There are, of course, a lot of people that are working on the problem, but the specific gain of function that the protein superoxide this mutase um, sort of implements due to the mutation is not completely elucidated. Um, as a result, or not necessarily as a result, but certainly as a consequence of the fact that the association is only statistical, we really don't have any kind of therapeutic approach uh, against the disease. In other areas, uh, we've been more lucky. Certainly in many of the uh, what we call rare Mendelian diseases um, that are associated, for instance, with dysfunctions in enzymes, uh, this has been quite effective because enzyme replacement therapy, for instance, in pompous disease, has been quite uh, uh, important. Uh, but those are the situation in which the actual mutation affects a endpoint gene or protein, basically, so the actual gene that is performing uh, the corresponding work in the cell, and therefore by replacing that protein, we can actually, or by targeting that protein, we do something about it. In many cases, uh, we will find that diseases are actually all but rare and Mendelian. In fact, they're complex, and the individual mutation really tells very little about the risk and the stratification of the risk. In cancer, uh, it's actually been a little bit ahead of the curve simply because a lot more data has been generated in cancer phenotype, but I think the same lessons that we've learned from human genetics in, uh, in, in, in complex disease uh, are now being rediscovered in, in cancer thanks to the uh, large amount of data that is available. And so we have, for instance, mutations such as the fusion event between the BCR, B cell receptor protein, and the ABL kinase um, that are 100% uh, in every single cell and every single patient with the chronic myelogenous leukemia. And that discovery uh, was instrumental in developing a drug called uh, Glivec or Imadenib um, that, in fact, has a spectacular response with respect to uh, patients with CML. Literally, patients that were going to die next week were taken off uh, their, their, their death sentence by this drug. And uh, that, that success has had the potentially um, unwanted consequence of really spurring the entire, or targeting the entire field of precision medicine to this direction of oncogene addiction. This is the fact that cells, cancer cells that have mutation in oncogenes tend to be addicted to the activity of. So unfortunately, it turns out that CML is more like the exception than the rule. And in fact, you can see right now that as we're starting to sort of drop down and elucidate more and more mutation in cancer, it's becoming increasingly hard to discover mutations that are really truly targetable and that are very high frequency in the population. So for instance, uh, one of the other great successes of, of targeted therapy has been in breast cancer with amplification and mutation of the HER2 protein, um, which is basically uh, a membrane protein that receives signals and, and generates pro-life and pro-proliferative signals. 
And, um, and in that case, the introduction of hydroxyltrastuzumab has been really, again, transformational for patients with that particular type of cancer, which before the introduction of trastuzumab were, in fact, among the patients that had the most aggressive type of tumors. Okay? Unfortunately, e even though 70% of patients treated with trastuzumab respond to the drug and actually uh, uh, this halts progression of the disease, about 70% of the ones that actually respond eventually will relapse to a disease that is no longer responsive to, to trastuzumab and typically has very poor outcome. If things get even worse, although some of these have been called great uh, sort of clinical accomplishments, which they are, uh, for instance, in the case of the V600E mutation in BRAF, the BRAF oncogene in, in melanoma, where in fact, a very potent, very high affinity inhibitor called vemurafenib has now tremendous response in patients, but unfortunately this response is not very uh, lasting, and in fact, typically somewhere between three and, and five months, virtually all patients treated with vemurafenib will relapse with a uh, BRAF independent version of the tumors that no longer responds to the inhibitor. And in fact, the inhibition of BRAF, uh, for those of you that are actually been at the talk that uh, uh, Mariano Barbacid gave yesterday, have other implications because they actually trigger major oncogenic behavior in, in other cells that would actually have dormant mutation in, in KRAS. Um, so this says that as we are starting to walk down, we now maybe profile about 8,000 tumors, uh, and we have now actually have genotypes, maybe uh, 20,000 to 30,000 tumors. Um, and as we're starting to walk down in terms of the frequency of the mutation, we're starting to discover that this is becoming a more lower and lower hanging fruit type of, of mechanism. And so actually not a lot of new targetable oncogenes are emerging. And the ones that are emerging almost invariably, including EGFR, ALK, MAC, et cetera, they all lead to uh, resistance after treatment. So the question here is whether we should think about a slightly different paradigm for addressing the, 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 the question of how to really use this paradigm of, of personalized or precision medicine. And, and the question that I'm going to raise today, and I'm going to try to convince you that maybe there are alternative, that are, uh, alternative options that are possible, is the following. So right now we have a tremendous repertoire of targeted inhibitors. We have inhibitors for many of the major kinases uh, and many other proteins that have import, play an important role in regulation of cellular processes. Right now, we're using these drugs very specifically in patients that harbor uh, the mutation of the corresponding target gene. But should we consider the opportunity of maybe using these drugs in patients that don't have these mutations? Are there going to be patients without the mutation that are actually really highly responsive to these inhibitors? And I'll try to convince you that that, is, in fact, is the case. And there are uh, probably as many patients without the mutation that are responsive to these drugs as patients that actually do have the mutation. The second thing is that despite the excitement for this uh, discipline of uh, precision medicine, genomic-based precision medicine, the reality is that most tumors, about 75% of the tumors, have no actionable mutation, including, if you include in the, in the, in the, in the number of actionable mutation, genes that we don't yet know how to, how to action. No, pharmacologically, like KRAS, for instance. So if you eliminate all the potentially actual mutation, you're still left with about 75% of the tumor. And so what are we going to do for the patients that present? And in fact, this is typically almost always the case. We get these reports from Foundation One, and we see that there's absolutely nothing that looks like it's targetable. So what are we going to do with these patients? Of course, the major problem that I highlighted before is, well, so if I have a HER2 patient that is now relapsed following HER2 uh, inhibition, inhibition treatment and now has a tumor that is no longer responding to trastuzumab, well, what's, what, what are the options? Typically, it's chemotherapy, which is not very effective. And in fact, typically, when you relapse following treatment with trastuzumab, you will tend to have a very poor prognosis. And then the final thing is that we're always talking about sort of not really curing cancer, but just transforming cancer into a more manageable, more chronic disease. But in fact, there are potentially targetable niches within the tumor uh, that is have now been identified as, for instance, tumor-initiating cells. Uh, some people like to call them tumor stem cells, which is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, 
Um, but those are the cells that actually are able to regenerate the tumors. But the interesting about these cells, interesting about these cells is that although they are essentially isogenic with respect to the full differentiated tumor compartment, they have exactly the same repertoire of mutations. They actually tend to have very different uh, uh, sensitivity to the drugs. So, for instance, EGFR mutated cells in the tumor initiating compartment do not respond to an EGFR inhibitor, and that's why the tumor eventually uh, relapses. So can we do something by targeting the mechanisms in the cells rather than targeting the mutation? Because the mutation is obviously something that may have different response in different cellular contexts. So what I'm going to try and, 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 and propose here uh, is the idea that we can actually take individual tumors without even looking at population, but then run them through the lens of what we have learned so far about the regulation of those tumors from a very large number of patients. And now when we do that, essentially the reductionistic approach that the network gives you collapses the number of possible hypotheses about driver gene to a, only a handful that we call master regulators, and that these genes actually present as optimal targets both for therapy and as potential biomarkers for the disease. Of course, this actually requires very massive computational power because both generating these models and interrogating them with patient-specific signature is an extraordinarily computationally intensive task. Fortunately, we have built one of the largest supercomputers here at Columbia in, on, on the East Coast. And I think there's only three of the, that size in an academic organization. Uh, and this is actually helping us do the kind of things that I'll talk about today. So let's start by thinking briefly about a very fundamental paradox, not just in cancer, but in virtually, so I'm giving you an example for cancer, but really this applies to every single complex disease you can think of. If I, so what you're seeing here is all the tumors, about 8,000 of them, that have been profiled by an initiative called the Cancer Genome Atlas, or TCGA. So all these tumors have been RNA sequenced, so we know the transcriptomic profile, have been profiled in terms of mutational profiles, et cetera. We have almost all the information about these tumors. And the really striking thing is that even if I do, don't do anything special, just looking at transcriptional profiles, all the basal breast cancers, I'm going to have a pointer, so but maybe with a, with a, so all the basal breast cancers, they all stick together. All the luminal breast cancer all stick together. Okay? If I try to do the same thing using the genetics of these tumors, so if I try to take the mutations in all of these 8,000 tumors and I try to do a similar clustering, these tumors will be all over the place. They will not cluster at all. Okay? So the paradox is very simple. How is it possible that something as heterogeneous as the mutational spectrum and landscape of, breast, of basal breast cancer or luminal breast cancer can actually give you a set of, of, of programs, a set of transcriptional programs that are so close, so similar. Okay? It doesn't make a lot of sense if you think about it. And I think everybody knows this intrinsically, but, but not many people have actually stopped to think about it, how, how that is in fact possible. Um, and this actually is reflected across virtually all tumors and all tumor sub subtypes. So one possible way to think about it is how can we connect the top half of this diagram where all the genetics patterns are, exist. In fact, one of the reasons, first, in, in, in uh, triple negative breast cancer, which largely overlap with the basal subtype, they're called triple negative because essentially lack any kind of identifiable mutations that distinguish that, that subtype. So no, literally no two patients with a triple negative breast cancer are identical in terms of their mutations. So how can we reconcile the top half of this diagram where all the mutation lives with the bottom part of the diagram where all the programs that are necessary for tumor maintenance live? Proliferation, uh, uh, abrogation of uh, immunodetection, uh, uh, immortalization, etc. So one possible way that, to think about that, and this is something that really came as the aha moment uh, to really convinced us that this was actually possible, uh, was part of a collaboration that my lab and Ricardo Alfavara's lab had, where we started from an observation that was really a serendipitous observation by loosed out uh, at the NCI, that a particular complex, the NF-kappa-B complex, in fact, the canonical uh, version of that complex, was a dependency, 
in a particular subtype of human lymphoma called the ABC activated B cell subtype of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And no, was not a dependency in another subtype that was almost identical but less aggressive called the GCB subtype. So this was a serendipitous observation. It means that if you actually silence NF kappa B in the ABC subtype, these cells die. If you silence NF kappa B in the GCB subtype, these cells are perfectly fine. It's what we would call a non-oncogene dependency because NF-kappa-B is never mutated in these tumors. So Ricardo had this brilliant idea that uh, at the time sequencing, you know, we're talking about 10 years ago, the sequencing was very expensive and certainly could not afford to do a genome-wide analysis of these fuse like cell lymphoma patients. We actually didn't even have enough of those to be able to have statistical power in the analysis. So he had a very clever idea that because the immunologists had done a fantastic job of dissecting after Baltimore uh, got an overprice for discovery and kappa B, all the pathways that were upstream of it, why not we sequence just a handful of genes in those pathways? Okay? It's a very simple, very simple concept. But lo and behold, about a dozen mutation popped up that are actually recurring patients that would have been invisible in any kind of GWAS study, like for instance, mutation in A20 gene, in CARD11, in MID88, et cetera. And then actually Lou, Lou, Lou Stout also pursued that line of, of thinking and discovered the MIT 88 was discovered in his lab, et cetera. So overall, almost a dozen or more than a dozen mutations have been discovered upstream of NF kappa B. And the really remarkable thing is that every time these cells had one of these mutations, you had dependency on NF kappa B activity. Anytime you didn't have that mutation, you didn't have dependency. And this didn't even co-segregate perfectly with the ABC and GCB subtype. It was really based on the mutations. Okay. So now you have to ask yourself, is it better to design one drug for A20, one drug for CARD11, one drug for MID88, one drug for the B cell receptor uh, subunits that are mutated, et cetera, or is it better to design one drug for the collector, the NF kappa B protein, which is now acquiring the signals from all these mutated gene upstreams? Okay. And so we thought that maybe the latter was, uh, was a better option, and we are pursuing this because, in fact, as Lou has also shown, many of the reason why these pathways become activated have not even to do with the mutations. For instance, some of these B cells actually secrete antigens that bind the BCR receptor because without binding to the BCR receptor, it's not even signaling. So you have to get, you get, have to have signals that come from the environment because otherwise the mutation would act as amplifiers. But if you have no signals at the beginning of the line, you can put out as many amplification you want, but it's not going to do anything, right? So what we thought is that if we actually could come up with a way to reconstruct the logic of the cell in a complete genomic, genome-wide uh, fashion, that we could actually use this logic to integrate essentially not only the genetics, but also all of the other potential reasons for tumor ideology, including microenvironment signals, contact signals, uh, autocrine loops, uh, uh, potential endocrine long-distance communication processes like you know, androgen being secreted, in the testes and then making to the prostate, et cetera, um, as well as the drugs, as well as the activity of drugs or other environmental factors. Okay, why? Because in the end, the cell is the sensor. And the reason you get cancer is not because at some point some weird combination does something wrong to the cell, it's because the cell actually has some pathways that are necessary to activate these programs that I showed you before. And when enough of these signals coming from either the genetics or the epigenetics or the environment are sum up on this on these uh, pathways, you actually trigger a tumorigenic event. Okay? It's exactly the same thing as in normal human genetics. If you look at height, there's probably 300 genes that have been associated with height. Each one gives you a very small contribution, right? But in height, if you have a lot of contribution, you just get taller and taller and taller, or shorter and shorter and shorter. In cancer, you add them up, add them up, and at some point you fall off a cliff. Okay? And so the question is not what is the driver mutation. And I think we're grossly underestimating the number of driver mutations that are now in tumors simply because we look for the smoking gun when in many tumors there is no single smoking gun. There's in fact a field effect for many, many mutations and many, many environmental factors that contribute to falling off that cliff. All right. So this is the theory that we essentially formulated to address this paradox. And the theory is that there are bottlenecks that are regulatory bottlenecks implemented by just a handful of protein. We're talking about about 10 of them or less. And this bottleneck collect all the aberrant signals 
that come from upstream pathways that harbor mutations and activate downstream all the necessary programs that are required for tumor maintenance or progression. Okay, it's a pretty striking hypothesis, but we were able to actually show that we could actually discover these bottlenecks in a large number of tumors. And so these are some of the papers where this was done. And I'll show you very precisely the methodology that was used for that, because otherwise it seems a little bit like science fiction. Um, but the one thing that I want to remind you is that the first thing you have to worry about is how can you create models of regulation that are sufficiently accurate that they can capture what's going on in these bottlenecks. Because what we found afterwards is that if you were to take what is published today in terms of canonical pathways or regulatory uh, maps of, of transcription factors, you would not be able to do this at all. Okay? So in order to do this, what we've done, we've spent about 10 years developing algorithms that have been uh, really uh, completely systematically validated experimentally to reconstruct transcriptional interaction, post-transcriptional interactions with microRNA. So this is transcription interaction is transcription factor regulating gene expression, microRNA regulating RNA, protein-protein interaction, and signal transduction pathways. Okay, we've not done a lot of work in metabolism because other groups have done a lot of work in that area. But the really key issue that we addressed from the beginning was to build regulatory models that were completely context-specific. So our models for a glioma cell are completely different from the models for a hepatocellular carcinoma, completely different from the model for a lymphoma, et cetera. And we build this model by analyzing, and I'm not going to go into details, otherwise we could spend a lot of time here, uh, but we, well, you can look at the papers that are published. Uh, we, we build this model by essentially analyzing a large number of molecular profiles that were representative of regulation in that particular cell type. It's called reverse engineering. It's like you take a car, and by observing how the car moves on a mountain road, you try to figure out how the gearbox works. But the beautiful thing is that once you have this model, then you can do some pretty interesting things. And if this model of the bottleneck is actually correct, or at least correct in part, this has very profound implication on how you should treat tumors and how you should treat human disease in general. And the implication is the following. Currently, the, the paradigm for precision medicine says that if I have an oncogene, I will actually drug that oncogene. I think that actually is probably the worst possible thing you would want to do. Why? Because you're actually killing the part of the tumor that you can manage, and you're letting the part of the tumor that you cannot manage survive. And at that point, that part of the tumor will no longer have any kind of competition for nutrient space, uh, vascularization, etc. And so what happens is typically when you, when, you, when you kill, for instance, with the HER2 inhibitors, the HER2 amplified portion of the tumor, and now you get cells that are completely resistant, those cells will actually explode and, take, and grow very, very rapidly. Okay? How do you get resistance? Well, first of all, you can have cells within the tumor due to tumor heterogeneity. Each cell has, in a tumor has different mutational load that may have bypass mutations. So even though it does have, say, the amplification over two, uh, it also has amplification downstream that will essentially abrogate the effect of the drug. This may be in a very small number of clones or subclones, but eventually you'll select those. Or it may have completely different subclones that don't even have the R2 amplifications um, and have completely alternative mutations. Why? Because actually the mutation of the oncogene are the last in a very long line of mutation that the tumor acquires. Okay? Those are the mutations that give your tumor competitive advantage in terms of growth. But the actual first mutation that you acquire typically loss of tumor suppressors. When you lose a tumor suppressor, you start inducing chromosomal instabilities, you have problems in DNA repair, et cetera, and so you start accumulating a lot of mutations. So each cell in a tumor, in that lineage that lost the, uh, the tumor suppressor, will start increasing the number of mutations. At the very end, you acquire a mutation in an oncogene, and now you start getting proliferative advantage and start growing like crazy. So what we're saying is that instead of dragging the tumor here, which will almost inevitably lead to uh, a relapse uh, to a form of the tumor that is, tum that is uh, inhibitory independent, we should drug the tumor here, which is where the bottleneck occurs. And this is for a couple of reasons. First of all, because um, you're now capturing all the mutations that may lead to that tumor, and that's important in, a, in one particular patient. But even more important, you now no longer have to develop one drug for one mutation, one drug for another mutation. You can now capture a large number of patients with the same type of drugs. 
This is just to show you that we have applied this paradigm not just to cancer, but to a lot of other non-cancer related diseases, from alcohol addiction to uh, stem cell uh, pluripotency control to ALS, which is now hopefully finally in, in press, uh, uh, and, and, and to Alzheimer's, et cetera. And in all of these diseases, which has been typically pretty difficult to tackle, we have found evidence, striking evidence, uh, leading to experimental validation of the same exact bottlenecks that we see in cancer, which this time are not controlled by somatic mutation, but rather by germline variants and environmental signaling. So why should, how can we find, how can we discover these uh, bottlenecks? I mean, obviously in the case of diffuse glass B-cell lymphoma, we were pretty lucky because there was some kind of serendipitous observation that NF-kappa B was one such uh, dependency. But in most tumors and in most phenotype, it's actually not one protein, but actually a couple of proteins. And individually, each individual protein does actually nothing for the phenotype. We need two of them or three of them. So how can we find these bottlenecks if we don't really have a way to screen even by loss of function assays? Well, the first thing you have to remember is that mutations don't actually do anything. Mutation is just sitting in the genome. It's a template for something that is going to be produced as a gene product. And so what that's something in a cell is either the RNAs that are regulatory or the proteins, most typically the proteins. And so the thing that we really have to worry about is not that much whether you have a mutation or not, but whether you have a barren activity of the corresponding protein or not. So if we had machines that could actually measure the activity of every protein in the human body uh, or in a particular cell type, that would be the ideal way to do the targeted therapy, because you could actually immediately figure out what works and what's not working, what works over you know, in, in a way that is not uh, uh, physiologic. But unfortunately, uh, measuring protein activity is extremely complicated. In fact, I don't think there is an assay that can measure protein activity directly, because protein activity is the sum of many, many events, including the translation from the RNA, the actual post-transcriptional modification of the proteins, and multiple sites that we have not yet figured out that will necessarily contribute to the activity, and very different type of, you know, from sumoylation, acetylation, uh, 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 phosphorylation, et cetera, to its translocation to the specific cellular compartment where that protein is active, to the formation of specific complexes that are necessary for regulation. So now, you may measure the abundance of a protein and think that that is its activity, but it's actually not. For instance, you can have a ton of STAT3, but if it's not phosphorylated, it will not work. You can have a ton of MYC, but if MAX is not there, it's not going to bind the DNA. And so measuring protein activity is actually very hard. So what we decided to do is to see whether we could use the regulatory networks to actually precisely measure, infer protein activity in the cell. How do we do this? Well, so here is a representation of one of our networks. Okay, so these are just representing four proteins for, for the sake of simplicity. And what the network does for you, it associates every protein in the cell, whether transcriptional regulator or not, signal transduction as well, to a set of transcriptional targets that represent its footprint, its transcriptional footprints. Okay? So this is the equivalent of what you normally do in the lab when you build a gene reporter assay. Now, if you want to report a MIC activity, you'll take a TERC promoter, stick it in front of a luciferase, and now if MIC is no longer working, your, your reporter will go down. If MIC is working over time, your, your luciferase will go up. What's the problem with that approach? Well, first of all, that chart promoters are not regulated just by MIC. They're regulated by a lot of different things. And so if you try to very specifically figure out whether MIC is activated or not, that's really not a good idea. The second thing is that MIC actually regulates things that are not regulated through the canonical max MIC binding. But in fact, the regulatory person represses to uh, uh, complexing with MIS-1. So how do we really measure the activity of MIC? in this case, will be by building the report, a multiplex gene reported assays that includes all the targets, all the transcriptional targets of MIC, both the repressed one and the activated ones, and uses the expression of those targets to infer whether MIC is active. And that reported, because it's multiplex, is going to be very, very specific for every specific protein that we have. So each protein has a different set of targets in our, in our network. Very few proteins have exactly the same targets, in fact, almost none. And therefore, we can build gene, multiplex gene report assays for virtually every protein in the cell. And then what we can do is we can basically ask a very simple question. We can ask not only whether the protein is activated, but whether its activity is specifically affecting the signature that are associated with the hallmarks of cancer. Okay? So for instance, this is actual real data that I'm showing here. Um, 
So you can see here all the genes from the one that is most down-regulated to the one that is most up-regulated in a particular phenotype, let's say tumor initiation, prostate cancer initiation. What you see as, as uh, red bars are the actual targets that in our network have been associated with these regulators that are positively regulated. And when you see as blue bars, these are the targets that are repressed by that regulator. And so you immediately see just by eye that all the positively regulated targets are all overexpressed and all the repressed targets are all underexpressed. So this indicates that not only that protein is highly activated in this transition, so it goes from not being active to being very active, but also that its activation regulates specifically the signature of the tumor. Okay? This second protein here has the exact opposite pattern. All the positive targets are, are down-regulated, and all the repressed targets are overexpressed. This means that this protein has lost activity because now you have completely inverted its pattern of activation, and this protein here essentially has had no change because its target is just not differentially expressed. Okay? So this allows us to uh, not only get very precise indication, but actually get indication from one single profile. So what this shows is we, what we did here is we have different versions of the algorithm that are better and better and better, where we measure the accuracy and the specificity. And in this case, we actually are collecting all the samples, six samples, in which we have silenced six different transcription factors, uh, anyway, from STAP3 to, to, uh, to, to FOX1, et cetera. And now we're showing how the algorithm can actually identify those transcription factors among the most likely proteins that have been uh, abrogated, those activities have been abrogated. And in fact, the best version of the algorithm, which is the one that we now call Vi Viper, uh, of virtual proteomics, actually predicted the silence gene as number one, number one, number one, number two, and two, uh, uh, sorry, two as number two, and one as number three. So really at the very top of the prediction. So instead of having this bioinformatics list where you have 500 genes that differentially express, you don't really know, uh, and now you do another experiment and the list maybe has 10% of a lap, you don't know. In this case, every single time you do this experiment, you get exactly the same top master regulators, and they are predictably the one that you have actually inactivated. But what this graph on the right shows is that you can do this from single assays and you get even more specificity. And the reason you get more specificity is because when you go across multiple cells and you, and you average the signature together, you actually are diluting. You, you're basically, the heterogeneity of the cell works against you. If you do the analysis on a cell-by-cell -cell basis, and I'll show you these results later on, you actually get even cleaner results. So this is the first time. That's why we don't like statistics because, you say, if you have to use statistics, you have to design better experiment. In this case, you just need one experiment, and that's the fundamental basis for what we call the N of 1 clinical trials that I'll discuss later on. So this is particularly useful to understand what are the targets and the effectors of drugs. Why? Because we now have these multiplex gene expression assays for every single protein in the cell, well, about 6,000 of them that have regulatory function, and now we can ask before and after we introduce the drug in that particular cellular context, did we observe a change in that reporter assay? And in this case, what this shows is that if you put fulvestrin, tamoxifen, or clomiphene, that probably many of you know are estrogen receptor inhibitors, you actually, when you have the higher dosage, you have a spectacular inhibition of the estrogen receptor activity as predicted from its targets. None of these compounds produces any differential expression of the estrogen receptor activity. Zero. It would not be detectable. Why? Because these compounds are post-translationally active. They bind to the protein. They don't bind. They have not, no effect on the RNA. And this shows that if you actually do the same with serolimus, which is an mTOR FKBP1A inhibitor, you get exactly the same result. So this is a post-translationally active protein. And we essentially do this for every kinase, every... So this now gives us uh, a very precise way to infer mechanism of action of drugs. And what we can do is match the mechanism of action of drugs from perturbation with drugs to the mechanism of action of the tumor and see what drug will hit the tumor. So what are some of the properties of this approach? Um, one of the things that you may ask is why has gene expression never been used as a good clinical parameter for, uh, for some diagnosis or prognosis or for drug therapy? Why are we using genetics today? Well, the reason is that if you measure gene expression, there's tremendous variability. It's all over the place. So on average, on a population, it may look like it's very predictive, but that's only because you're averaging over many, many patients, right? When you actually look in individual patients, it's not really predictive at all. And you can see this uh, by comparing the variance and variability of essentially the prediction of the correct genes, which should be right at the top, when you use gene expression in the brown curve 
versus the activity predicted by the mass regulator analysis. So with the mass regulator analysis, you really completely kill the variability and you reproducibly predict the exact same protein in all different assays that target that particular protein. Okay? And we were able to, sh to show that, in fact, you get optimal behavior when you have about 50 targets in your regulatory network for the protein. So what we do now is that if you have 1,000 targets, we start removing the targets of which that we have less certain on until we get to about 50 that are the most precisely uh, predicted targets of that protein, and that gives us the optimal assay. And this also shows you something really remarkable, I think, which is perfectly reasonable, and if you think about it, which is that if you actually start downsampling your RNA-seq from 30 million reads all the way down to 10,000 reads, okay, if you look at the ability of gene expression to be produce the same correlation between two samples, I'm taking a sample of 30 million and a sample of 2 million, a sample of 30 million, a sample of 10,000, and I'm asking, do I see this the, a strong correlation between the expression of the genes? That degrades very dramatically. Okay, so you lose. Uh, you lose quality, you lose uh, ability to predict. But if you actually predict the master regulator, if you actually do this analysis in terms of activity, of predicted activity, using this gene reporter assay, there is essentially no degradation in performance until you hit about 500,000 reads, and then it degrades quite gracefully. And so even with 100,000 reads, you can actually have pretty much the same exact top master regulators predicted by the algorithm. This is very important because actually this was the key for developing a technology that we call PlateSeq that was developed by Peter Sims that can now do RNA-seq for $12, about 2 million reads, and gives us exactly the same result that we get from 30 million. So we can now profile a vast repertoire of small molecule that can then be tackled to a very specific problem, whether it is a neurodegenerative disease or cancer. Okay, so let's ask question number one. Question number one was, we have a lot of targeted inhibitors we probably don't know what to do with them because we're only using them to target patients that have a specific mutation in those genes. So the question is, could we target patients that actually have no mutation in the gene but are likely to respond to the drug? So what I'm showing here is for every tumor type that we have, and I'm, I'm showing you a small number of them, and for every tar targetable gene or even potentially targetable gene like KRAS, we have ranked all the patient in TCGA, so there's about, you know, 500 patients for glioma, 1,000 patients for breast cancer, et cetera. We have racked all the patients based on our predicted activity of that corresponding protein in that particular sample. And so you have samples here that have very low activity, so they're lower than average. This is average, and these are samples that have much higher activity, okay? With that, we, we did not use the mutational data at all in this analysis. Okay? This is purely based on the reported assays as I've described it. What you see, however, is that all the patients with the mutation stratify with the samples that have the highest activity. Those are the, the green bars. So a couple of things. If you have a patient that has a mutation but is predicted a very low activity of EGFR, I'm pretty sure it's not going to respond to EGFR. I'm actually going to show you it doesn't. Uh, if you have a patient that doesn't have the mutation and has a very, very high activity of EGFR, in fact, higher than patients that have mutations, then that patient probably should respond to EGFR. Okay? And you can do this across every single targetable gene. You can do this across every single mutation for which you have at least four samples in TCGA. So here you can, you can see that mutation in BRAF, you can even read them, but for instance, the, 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 the P40403F uh, uh, mutation uh, has absolutely no effect on the activity of BRAF, while the V600D has a very profound effect. So this tells you which patient may have mutation in a gene, maybe actually in the, low, in the low bar, simply because it's not hitting the spot that induces the gain of function. So how do we know that this works? Because we've actually taken a very large repertoire called the, cell line, uh, the cancer cell line encyclopedia, which is about, what, 1,000 cell lines, but of which about 400 have been profiled against about 350 inhibitors, okay? And so we know exactly which one of these cells are the most responsive, which are the ones above this, 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 this dotted line, versus the ones that are non-responsive, which are the one below the solid line. Now the first thing you can look is now, I'm reporting, I'm showing you all, this, all the cell lines in lung cancer cell lines, so these are only lung cancer lines, that have EGFR mutation as a large circle green dot. And as you can see, there's almost as many of the green dots below the line as there are above the line. 
So this suggests that mutation may not be the best parameter to determine whether a cell line is sensitive to an EGFR inhibitor or not. But if you actually look at the activity, so anything in the green bar here is predicted to very high activity, and anything here predicted not to have high activity, you can see that the vast majority of the cells that actually are predicted to have high activity and predicted to actually have mutations will respond to the inhibitor, and the one predicted to have low activity and mutation will not respond to the inhibitor. In fact, the p-values here, if you only use the mutation, is significant, but it's not that great. The p-value, if you use the actual only the activity predicted is actually quite spectacular, 10 to the minus 6, right? So you can do a pretty good job of prioritizing who will respond to inhibitor by using only the predicted activity. And our networks still suck. You know, they're not yet ideal, so this can only improve as we learn from more samples how this, 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 this uh, uh, profile works. So let me show you kind of a complete story, starting from knowing really nothing about a particular tumor type, so having drugs that can, that can treat it using this type of paradigm. So this is work that was done in collaboration with Corey Abadashan, uh, which has now been licensed to LabCorp, and for which we are developing uh, several clinical studies that are follow-ups. And the target was to uh, dissect the etiology, the molecular etiology of aggressive prostate cancer. As you know, prostate cancer is a relatively indolent disease. In fact, most men with prostate cancer, 90% of them, will not die of prostate cancer. But in a very small number of cases, you actually get very aggressive progression to a, what's called androgen-independent version of the disease, and that tends to have a very poor prognosis. So the question that we had is, can we actually identify the key regulators that are responsible for progression from a non-aggressive form of the disease to an aggressive form of the disease? And we decided to do this because Corey has significant strength in, in mouse models, both using human data and using mouse data. For the human data, we could use a very large collection of tumors that were harvested by, from patients at biopsies um, that was collected by the late Bill Gerald at Memorial Sloan Kettering and then published by Charles Sawyer. And so that was great. It produced a very high quality network that has been frankly validated. It looks absolutely great. For the mouse, however, nobody's crazy enough to put together a, uh, 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 what do you call it, a mouse cohort. So we were you know, crazy enough to do that, and it was a very, very lengthy and costly experiment, uh, but it was really actually instrumental in these, obtaining these results. And so how do we do the, that? So Corey and, 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 and I work with the community to collect essentially 13 different mouse model prostate cancer, including five that were very aggressive, others that were just normal epithelium, uh, preneoplastic lesion, frank adenocarcinoma, and metastatic carcinoma. And then each one of those models was treated in vivo with 13 drugs plus the MSO. So we had about 300 prostate tissues that were each one with a different background and different drug treatment. And that was phenomenal to reconstruct a, a regulatory model for the mouse. And we actually showed for the first time that this is quantitatively that about 70% of the regulatory program in the human are identical to the one in the mouse but 30% are not, and in fact, depending on what you study. So that's a great model. If you want to study a particular protein, it'll tell you whether you can study that protein in a mouse or not. But more importantly, it led to discovery of seven master regulators that were identically conserved between the mouse and the human. So these are, these are genes that are underexpressed in the aggressive prostate cancer and overexpressed versus overexpressed in prostate cancer. The red bars are the positive targets of this protein. Uh, the blue bars are the repressed targets. And you can see, again, the stratification. Okay. Note these numbers here, which are very small, you can't read them. None of them is below 500. That's the rank of that particular gene by differential expression. Okay? None of those genes is actually differentially expressed to a way that you will be able to pull them out of the list and say, oh, this is an interesting gene. I want to follow up on it. We did the analysis because in many other studies that we've done, we discovered that tumors were not regulated by single protein, but by synergistic interaction of two proteins. And so we did an analysis that basically says what, which one of these pairs of the, of the seven uh, potential mass regulators were actually predicted to be synergistic. And as you can see from this table, there was only one pair that was predicted to be quite spectacularly synergistic. It was a pair of FOXM1 CMPF. And you can just look at this graph and understand what we mean by synergy. Of course, there is a quantitative uh, sort of uh, definition of it, but this is the uh, intuitive version of it. The targets of both proteins are much more enriched in the actual signature than the targets of the individual protein. So you can see here, these targets are all blue, non, you know, blue means underexpressed, red means overexpressed, and the uh, white means uh, not differentially expressed. And you can see that the targets that are co-targets of both proteins are actually exquisitely enriched in the very aggressive signature, okay? 
So we can do this now systematically and it's been 100% validated. Every single time we find one of these things, we see that we go to the lab and we see synergy. How do we see the synergy? Because you can actually uh, take mouse models when you grow these tumors as xenograft and when you silence either FOXM1 or CMPF, you had very modest decrease in tumor growth, which has actually been reported by other labs. Okay? So these genes do very little by themselves. When you actually co-silence both of them, this tumor completely collapse. And in fact, the best type of assay is not that because you can get epigenetic silencing of the SHRNA uh, uh, the expression, but one where we do a competition in vivo between cells that are either red and silence FOXM1 or green and silence CMPF or uh, yellow and silence both of them. And so when you start with an exact equal number of the cells, after 25 days, the yellow compartment essentially disappears. Now, that's interesting because it, it, it indicates that, in fact, this tumor regulation goes through the protein that we have identified from the mouse in the human studies. Um, but the more interesting, but remember, we did not study these proteins in that particular xenograph. That xenograph was used only for validation. We validated in every single one of the five models. But the more striking result is this one. This tells you that if you actually look in immunohistochemistry for the staining of uh, these two proteins at diagnosis, and then you follow this patient for up to 20 years. Across 900 patients, maybe three of them died that had the double negative for FOXM1 and CMPF. So this can tell you as, as early as 20 years before whether you will die or not die of prostate cancer. Okay? I've never seen a curve like this. I don't know, maybe some of you have seen it, but I've never seen a curve that is completely flat for one particular version of the biomark and essentially represent 90% or the burden of the disease because basically the patients that are in the red curve are the one with the double positive and they represent about 90% of the patients that died of prostate cancer in that cohort. Okay? This individual uh, biomarkers, as you can see, they're not even statistically significant. Maybe a little bit FOXM1, but if you have a p-value of 0.01 uh, on 900 patients, you better pack and go home. Uh, very unlikely that anybody will go after that biomarker. But more importantly, we think that these are patients that actually acquired the FOXM1, so I had the FOXM1 and acquired a CMPF uh, activation later on and therefore became positive for both and then progressed the disease. So that indicates that this patient should be actually followed up if you have a, if you have a single positive, if you have a double positive, probably never, nothing bad is going to happen to you. But if you have a single positive, you probably want to track that patient down and see whether it develops uh, maybe three years, four years after that, a, 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 another mark. So why is the genetic complicated? So now that we know that FOXM1 and CMPF are both necessary and sufficient for the tumor phenotype, we can actually go upstream and ask what are the genetics. So this is an algorithm that was recently published in Cell uh, called DIGIT, which basically identifies all the mutations that contribute to the aberrant activity of FOXM1 and CMPF. So FOXM1 is on the top, CMPF is on the bottom. All the, all the mutations that are in the same amplicon are actually grouped in those brackets. The others are in completely different chromosomes. They're all over the place. And what this is telling you is exactly that additive model that I told you before. You don't activate FOXM1 because you get one mutation. You activate FOXM1 because of an entire spectrum of mutation, which is slightly different in each one of the patients. Okay? And so it's very difficult to develop a classifier based on the genetics because you have to figure out all the possible things that could happen. And probably many of them we cannot even map because they're exclusively, exquisitely uh, private to that particular patient. Um, but if you actually just look at the activity of the protein, it just stares at you in the face. And the good news is that we use the same exact model to now prioritize which drugs among the 13 that we have tested in these mouse models could be used to shut down the tumor by hitting, not by changing the viability in phenotypic assays, but actually because it was targeting very specifically the targets that were regulated by FOXM1 and CMPF, the co-targets. Okay? And the computer said there's no single drug that can do that. They're not very good individually, but there's a combination, which is rapamycin and a MEK inhibitor, a Pfizer drug, that actually does that very effectively. And in fact, when you put that combination in the mouse, these tumors shrink by about ninefold. And these are very aggressive tumors than I would have. Now, of course, the, actually that combination is in the clinic. People would say that it would have been, you know, already known. Of course, it's already known, but we started with 13 compounds only. Now we do this with 1,500 compounds, and we discover a lot of completely novel uh, single drugs and combinations. Uh, 
but in fact, but the, but the point here is simply that when you ask the computer what combination of drug you should use or single drug, it said that one, and it worked really well. So this paper is basically accepted at several ports and should be seen frequently. So, so a couple of other examples. This is exactly another bottleneck where we showed with Adolfo Ferrando that in patients that relapse following glucocorticoid treatment in TLL, which essentially cures 70% of the patients, the, the key master regulators is AKT1. It was one of nine proteins that have been identified by the algorithm. Three of them validated, one of them was AKT1. And AKT1 actually phosphorylates the glucocorticoid receptor at serine 134 and prevents its translocation to the nucleus. So you can put as much glucocorticoid as you want in these patients, it's, it's inactivated. And you should notice that AKT1 is downstream from a gazillion different mutations in the AKT pathway, P10 pathway, PI3 kinase pathway, mTOR pathways. And so it doesn't matter where you have those mutations, if it increases the activity of AKT1, you will get resistance. But if you actually abrogate the activity of AKT1 directly with the drug, in this case MKO6, um, you see that there is dramatic rescuing of sensitivity to glucocorticoid receptor. These are in, in transplants from patients that were sensitive. This is a clinical trial that is now enrolling patients in breast cancer that are resistant to trastuzumab, uh, so HER2 positive breast tumors, and this was due to work, collaborative work between my lab and Jose Silva's lab where we identified STAT3 as the master regulator of resistance, and this is because downstream of STAT3 you have IL-6 which gets secreted, activates the IL-6 receptor, just that cascade, now you have this vicious loop that keeps going even if you shut down the signal or V2. Okay? So if you actually use uh, each one of these two drugs in isolation, they have very little effect, these tumors continue to grow. If you actually use the combination, there are profound effects and this tumor melts. And so this was very convincing data in several models and uh, it led to the approval of this study. So a couple of saying glioma, the same thing. We have published CP beta, CP delta, and, and STAT3 as the synergistic master regulators. And in fact, silencing any of these proteins does absolutely nothing. Uh, but silencing CB beta and STAT3 or CB delta and STAT3 actually completely abrogates tumor genesis in vivo, only one animal out of 12 had any tumor in that animal did not have a glioma because uh, you can see from human bimenting staining, uh, there's no migration of these cells in the nearby tissue, which is the hallmark of, this, of these tumors. Uh, and instead, silencing the individual proteins had no, basically no effect. Uh, interestingly enough, coectopic expression of these two proteins reprograms neural stem cells into a mesenchymal phenotype, mesenchymal lineage. And the same genes actually were rediscovered by the people that transform the fibroblast into neurons, okay? So except in the, in the opposite direction. So when I was telling you that this approach is actually very robust and very insensitive to noise, I told you that in, in single experiments, so you take a single profile, this will actually reproducibly generate the same result. But what about single cell? So these are 85 cells from one human glioma. Actually, no, this is a mouse model of the glioma that were isolated. And when we did the analysis on the RNA of these cells, which is only 2 million reads, it's very, very noisy, you can actually see that two-thirds of them have exactly the same master regulators that we published for the proneural subtypes, and one-third have exactly the same master regulators that we published for the uh, mesenchymal subtype. So within one tumor, you are now representing two completely different versions of the tumor. And these are isogenic. They have the same mutational backload. This is pure plasticity, where the tumor can move between the two states. And so you're just more likely to be in one than the other if you have certain mutation, but you will still have both. And so now, this is very important in precision medicine because now you know that in order to treat patients with glioma, you have to figure out how to treat both of these tumors simultaneously in the same patient. Or maybe force the tumor into one of the two compartments and then kill it in that compartment. Okay. All right. So I told you everything about how we find these biomarkers. Now I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, to finish this, this presentation on how we can find the actual drugs. And so basically the idea is that we can take drug signatures, run them through the same exact regulatory model, and then figure out what are the target inhibitors that will abrogate the dependencies of these tumors. So the way we do this is by taking a large repertoire of FDA-approved and experimental compound, typically about 2,000 of them, and then, because we can now do RNA-seq for $12, we can now afford to do, for each drug, multi-time points, so 6 hours, 12 hours, and 24 hours, and multi-concentration, the IC20, so the two sublethal concentration, one and one-tenth of the other, and in replicate. And that is incredibly informative about the mechanism of action of the drugs. It tells us, essentially, the entire repertoire of proteins that are either inactivated or activated by the drug. And these are all papers. Uh, Viper is in, in review now at Nature Genetics. Syngen has been published in Nature Biotechnology. 
and demand is impressed at cell. These are all different ways by which we look at these genes. And I've already showed you this data for, EG, for the estrogen receptor and, and serolimus. Um, but those are things we already knew. How about discovering things that we didn't know? So we run this analysis to say, can we find an inhibitor for MYC in breast cancer? And so these are the top 20 or so uh, uh, compounds that were prioritized by that analysis. And the first one is just a positive control, which is a compound that actually is a known probe compound that inhibits MYC activity. And so you can see that in a dose-dependent manner, so low dose to high dose, we see significant inactivation of MYC using a tert luciferase reporter. So this is the reporter that I was telling you before. And this is almost completely phenocopied, essentially, by the top uh, nine compounds that we predicted from scratch. So this is completely a novel discovery of an inhibitor of a gene uh, protein that is considered to be undragable. So now, how do we apply this to our precision medicine study is very simple. We basically use single patient uh, signature from RNA-seq, which actually is much less expensive than doing a full genome. So for about $300, but we could actually do it for $12 if you use uh, plate seq, we can get a signature from a patient. And that signature is in, used to interrogate the regulatory model that is specifically built for that tumor model. So we cannot do all tumors, but we can do a pretty significant number of them, about 20 of them. And that generates a signature of candidate master regulators that are apparently activated. So these are bad proteins that are regulating the tumor. And these are good proteins that have been shut down, so no longer prevent the tumor. So these are the accelerators, and these are the brakes. We can then screen a large number of compounds. And so we're now screening. We have already screened for neuroendocrine tumors, as I'll show you. And we now have in the queue uh, glioma, uh, meningioma, neuroblastoma, and, breast can and basal breast cancer, uh, where we screen entire repertoire of the approved compounds, and we then run the signature that we obtain in, in appropriate cell lines, and now we are also including, uh, starting to include explants from patients, so we can actually measure the activity of the drug directly in the tissue of the patient, so we never have to even rely on the cell line, even for screening the compound mechanism of action. And now what we want is the compound that simply invert that signature. We want all the proteins that are red to become blue, and we want all the proteins that are blue to become red. Okay? Why do we want that? Well, because we know already from having done this in about 20 tumor types, that if you hit the correct master regulator or master regulator pair, this signature will invert. Why? Because these master regulators are all in a module. They all regulate each other. So not all of them are master-master regulators. You know, they're, they're, they're working together, but some of them are more massive than others, and when you hit those, either individual in combination, it collapses the entire activity. So now these massive regulators become essentially another reporter assay, but it's an activity reported assay that tells you whether the drug is working or not. And we can also use this to prioritize synergistic compounds, so drug pairs, as I showed you for the case of, of, of prostate cancer, because we can ask whether there is a drug that shuts down a portion of the signature, so that drug obviously did not hit the crucial mass regulator, maybe because there's synergy between two different genes, and that drug only hits one of them, and the other drug hits the complement, and then in that case, when you put the two drugs together, you collapse the entire signature. And so this was published recently in Nature by Technology. Um, so we applied this, and now we have three different, two, I already, uh, three different clinical studies that are that have opened. One is, I already told you about, is there two positive breast cancer, that's just with one combination. Oops. Um, the other one is a SWOG, uh, a study where we take patients that have undergone neoadjuvant treatment for breast cancer but present at uh, uh, the uh, sort of resection with very substantial mass. And then the final one is a really uh, very, um, um, let's say, uh, unusual and, and very uh, far looking study where we actually crawl in 260 patients in nine different tumor types that are either very rare or very aggressive and uh, untreatable. Um, and we have now partnered with several pharmaceutical companies that have provided us for their compounds. So this all started with uh, one patient with a neuroendocrine, a very rare neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, it's a tumor that kills Steve Jobs. And this was also a very wealthy patient who essentially helped us fund an initiative to collect something around 1,000 fresh frozen biopsies from neuroendocrine tumors around the world, which is a, a repository that simply doesn't exist anywhere. Uh, because this is very rare type of tumor, and so we it took 16 different research centers to do that. But from that collection, we were able not only to stratify all the different subtypes of these neuroendocrine tumors, so these are the pancreatic, uh, 
in gray, the uh, ileal and, and uh, gastrointestinal midgut in, in, in pink, and the rectal in, in, uh, in, in blue-green. Um, but also, we use this to build a regulatory model for neuroendocrine tumors that simply didn't exist before. And so this is about half a million interaction between transcriptional and, and signaling interactions. And these were instrumental in reconstructing the master regulators or the dependencies of one individual patient and with every single individual patient in those, in those 1,000. So this now shows you all the genes that are master regulators. Some of them are very interesting, like for instance, uh, CD4, uh, CD80, uh, CD19. These are genes that are strongly associated with immunosuppression. So they may actually suggest novel ways in which we can uh, re, uh, uh, and so re restart a new system for these tumors. Others, about half of these have been validated. You shut them down and silence them by sHRNA, tumor viability goes down quite dramatically. So uh, we now need to find a model to test both the sHRNAs but also the drugs. And so what we did, we looked at several cell lines and we found ones that didn't work. For instance, this cell line, the mass regulator of that cell line had nothing to do with the mass regulator of the patient, but there was one cell line called the HSTS, which is a metastatic uh, 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 hepatic metastasis from a ileal patient that actually had almost perfect overlap between the, ma the positive master regulator, which are the one you can shut down with the drug, and the master regulator of the patient. And in fact, about 75% of the top master regulator of that cell line and of the corresponding xenograft were identical to the one of the patient. So this looked like a pretty good model. So what we did is we worked with Stuart Schreiber at the Broad Institute and screened a large number of compounds to identify the ones that were more specific, even slightly more specific, to the neuroendocrine lines versus all other tumors. So he had screened about 360 different cell lines and selected the top 100. And then what we did is we profiled those 100 compounds by RNA-seq, in this case it was full 30 million RNA-seq, um, and we profiled them at multiple time points, multiple concentration, uh, it's about $250,000 worth of work, but it was really worth the effort. Because as you can see, the top compound, drug number one, completely inverts the signature. So this is now all the proteins in the cell that we can monitor, from the one that has been most inactivated by the drug to the left, to the one that is most activated by the drug to the right. The red bars are the positive master regulator of that patient. The blue bar are the negative master regulator of the patient. So this drug has completely inverted the signature. The master positive one has been shut down, the negative one had been activated. Not only that, but very interesting, it's the top drug at both concentrations. So both the IC20 of the drug and one-tenth of that concentration have essentially the same effect. And you can see this also for the second drug. Maybe a little bit less on the negative one, but the positive one are very well inverted. And so this now gives you an entire repertoire of drugs, and what we see is that anything above 10 to the minus 10 p-value essentially completely inverts the signature. So we can now prioritize all 100 compounds, and you'll see that about five drugs that are here essentially completely invert the signature, and there's a bunch of drugs that don't do very much, and some of them that don't do absolutely anything. Okay, remember, these drugs have been prioritized because they were killing, very specifically, the neuroendocrine cells in vitro. They're predicted, they're most of them, not to do anything at all. So we decided to, t to test three compounds, and now we're actually testing an additional three from the top. One that was the top one, one that was called tevantinib, a CMAT inhibitor that was kind of in the middle and a little bit of activity at one concentration, not much at the other, and then one that was at the bottom. Why do we, how do we pick this one? Well, this compound, pharmacologically, is supposed to be identical to this one. They're both class one HDAC inhibitors, okay? So a pharmaceutical company would tell you this is pretty much the same drug. When you put these drugs in a mouse, the one at the bottom had absolutely no effect. It grew exactly the same in the mouse as if you had put BMSL. The one that was predicted to do a little bit did a little bit, maybe reduced viability by about 30%, and the top compound had complete clinical response or preclinical response in the mouse. Okay? So, so now we are prioritizing, we're working with a group of investigators at Dana Farber, at Numerous Sloan Kettering, and other centers to actually start a clinical trials because what we can now do is take all the patients in our cohort and prioritize one by one which drugs they would respond to. And because we're prioritizing our drugs by the bottlenecks, which are incredibly well conserved across this patient, you can see that all these patients, 19 patients, the vast majority of them, are sensitive to exactly the same set of drugs. Okay? So we can very easily build what is called a basket study where we'll test a few, a very small number of drugs to see which one actually works in patients. And the biomarker is going to be the actual 
activity of the mass regulator in those patients. So everywhere you see even a little tiny bit of pink here, that is a drug that works at p-value 10 to the minus 10 or better, so it completely reverses the signature. So you, have, you may think that here there's no drug that works, but actually these drugs work pretty well. These drugs are actually all pi 3 kinase M mTOR uh, AKT inhibitors. So you can see here that essentially with a very small number of drugs, you can cover a very large percent, a very large fraction of the tumors in that particular subtype. This is mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors. In, if you go to rectal, there's now two subtypes, each one about 40%, and you have to use different drugs in two subtypes. So I'm going to finish here and just tell you that what we have done essentially is changed a little bit the paradigm for drug discovery and for matching the drugs into patients based on biomarkers by taking a traditional paradigm that essentially screen drugs first in vitro, then whatever works in vitro you'll put in a mouse, and whatever works in a mouse now you'll put in a clinical trial, which has major problems because you're selecting the drugs based on the idiosyncratic behavior of cell lines that have nothing to do in terms of the genetic structure of the tumor and of, uh, uh, and of the mouse, which is still another uh, not completely uh, 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 endogenous uh, sort of environment. Um, and therefore, what emerges out of here typically has about one in 10 chances of working in, in, a, in a clinical study, okay? What we do is we now call it the human to mouse to human because we start exquisitely from patient signatures that are obtained from their tumor explants to both build the model of regulation and actually to interrogate it to identify the, 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 the proteins that these tumors are dependent on. And then we're screening in cell lines only to I, I, I identify the mechanism of action of drugs, which is actually very well conserved in, cell, in, in, in vitro because if you have a SARC in, inhibitor in vivo, it will also inhibit SARC in vitro. So it's just a, a different detection mechanism, but you can actually do it pretty well. But we're eliminating even that step. As I said, we're starting to do this in explants from patients um, using these uh, organotypic uh, culture assays that have been developed. And then once we have prioritized those drugs, we're now going to put them in patients. Okay, so this is, a, I think, a fairly novel approach to precision medicine.